Welcome back to the Religion and Story podcast. Today's topic for the podcast is money in the church, specifically dealing with church budgets, how churches choose to spend their money, and if there's any way that churches overall can improve their decision making. Now, we know that every church is a little bit different depending on the size of your church, the location of your church, and the history of your church. There's all sorts of different decisions that could be made. But we're going to speak in broad strokes and see if we can come up with any good ideas that might be worth uh, considering at your congregation. So, Stephen, I think you've thought a little bit about this. So why don't you open us us up with some thoughts, uh, maybe some questions that you have about how churches spend their money? Right. So I have my background in finance myself, but I'm by no means an expert uh, in church finances, how uh, church entities are set up uh, and and how a church delegates who is responsible for finances. And so that's something that maybe we even need to talk about. But uh, we have different religious groups that have even taken uh, – they, they feel that it is necessary to distinguish themselves purely based upon how they handle their finances. Uh, and those of, of you listeners that listen to it just because of you have a Church of Christ relation to maybe one of the, uh, the brothers on this podcast, there's also a, a group with a similar name uh, to the Churches of Christ called the Churches of Christ Non-Institutional, I believe is uh, their uh, their title that they uh, go by, and they distinguish themselves as a religious group that does not uh, put any of their funds into an outside organization. I know that that's actually common or common with a a few other religious groups, and even some churches of Christ uh, follow this practice. Uh, But not to say that all churches around the globe do that, or even churches of Christ themselves, uh, but Uh, The first thing that I think we should talk about is a budget necessary for a church to function. And I think we can all agree that budgets are healthy for uh, uh, somebody that's setting up their own personal finances. But is that something that is necessary for a church to have, to be financially responsible? Uh, Should they be leveraging debt or should they avoid uh, taking debt in order to grow and uh, take on that extra risk so that they can have the funds necessary to minister in whatever need that they deem appropriate. Um, Most churches do not take on uh, more debt than they need to. One, because they are for their nonprofits. That's how they have to operate, uh, at least in the United States tax codes to be able to uh, get the, uh, the, the write-offs for uh, certain expenses and uh, just to be able to operate as a nonprofit. Um, and so considering all these things, uh, it's very important for a church to be very meticulous in how they are setting up their budget and uh, measuring out their spending so that uh, they are not accused of uh, providing more leisure to uh, the people of the church rather than a ministry. And so that's something that I think that we'll want to talk about. And as far as a church budget goes, I would say, yes, it is very important that you have a budget, that you abide by it, and that it is something that is going to be um, a conservative budget where growth is only going to be uh, uh, strived after as much as the congregation is willing to put into it itself. Guys, uh, Daniel, uh, as far as church growth, how much do you think the financial means of a church should play into that? It makes sense to make church growth the main uh, secondary uh, element of a church budget. They have to maintain, primarily they have to pay the ministers, uh, keep the lights turned on. That's everything that needs to go to that must go to that. Um, but then obviously, I would say, yeah, your, your next biggest priority is growing the congregation. Uh, there's both a business reason for that, uh, that that's how you're going to, uh, can, by bringing in more, more members, uh, more partners in the gospel, that's how 
um, your church is going to be able to continue to grow. But also there's clearly a, a spiritual reason for that. That is, um, in many people's minds, the ultimate goal of the gospel is to bring as many into the fold as possible. And for that reason, yeah, it definitely makes sense to make church growth um, where a large portion of your church budget is going to. Michael, what are your thoughts on allocating the church budget? So when it comes to church budgets and the, the way they are intertwined with growth, it, you just have to be self-aware as a congregation. Can we sustain a, a budget that we plan out for the next year? Sometimes congregations will be aspirational. They'll, they'll shoot for something high in order to encourage their members to give at a higher rate. And maybe when they're halfway through, you know, the, the, the preacher will, uh, the, the elders might even ask the preacher to, to from the pulpit to to encourage the members to to give generously. I mean that that is a message in Scripture that we are to give generously. But part of that, part of giving generously, is knowing what you're giving towards. I think that you can't budget for growth. Rather, growth happens because your budget is on mission. Your budget reflects the values of the people that you are attracting. Uh, for some, that will be foreign missions. For others, that will be local benevolence, local missions, reaching out to a community in need. And when the people see that a congregation prioritizes uh, those sorts of things, then they will be attracted to that church. Uh, they'll be attracted to that congregation and want to serve alongside them and, and thus adding additional dollars to it. Um, however, at the, the the other side of that same coin is sometimes churches spend money on attracting families by having uh, a youth group that does a lot of activities or a young families min ministry that uh, is very appealing to people that are wanting to be fed. And uh, I don't want to say that, that there's anything wrong with those necessarily, but it could be wrong if you were doing so without respect uh for what the gospel message does tell us to do and the way we are supposed to give uh, to further God's kingdom by bringing new people in, not, not stealing sheep from other congregations. Um, I'll, I'll put one other crazy idea around this, this growth idea. I wonder if congregations would grow more if that I'm not, you wouldn't advertise this necessarily, but you might just say this before you pass around the collection plate. You know, number one, if you're not a member here, we don't ask you to give. But also, if you've only been a member with us for less than six months, less than a year, we also ask that you don't give. We ask that you give to outside organizations that are doing God's work. But we want you to feel comfortable here before we ever ask you for a single dime. Uh, I think to some people, it might be encouraging to know that the church isn't out there for their money. They're out there for their souls. And that's what they consider to be. Uh, more important. Um, any other quick reflections on, yeah, go ahead. Not that they're out there for their souls, but they're out there for their service when you're uh, almost pledging yourself to a congregation and to work under their eldership, then that you are essentially, if you aren't familiar with their budget, and you know, people probably don't do as much due diligence uh, before joining a congregation as you sh should. I mean, you're mainly checking off the boxes of, are, is my family going to uh, grow here? Uh, if you're a, a young uh, college single, uh, am I going to be able to find my uh, future spouse here and develop a Christ-centered marriage in that aspect? If you're a empty nester, um, am I going to be able to minister in ways that a congregation is able to use my skill set? Those mm -hmm. are things. Do you ever get down the checklist to checking off how the church spends their budget? Maybe not. Maybe that's not the most pressing thing to you, but not to say that it is not something that you should consider. And that's kind of why we're doing this podcast to begin with. Right. So ha having said that, um, we talked about foreign missions and uh, uh, local missions itself. I myself see a, a, it's commonly confused to uh, ministering to the congregation itself, uh, confused with ministering locally. Uh, and 
you need to make sure that you are distinguishing between uh, the church giving an offering and basically just getting it right back versus the church giving an offering and then going and finding people that are not members or, or are not involved in the church and trying to figure out how you can serve and minister to them to get them, uh, at that point, it does become about their soul and bringing them into the flock. You, do you guys see that there's something that needs to be distinguished there? Or am I reading too yeah. much into it? I've seen churches break down their budget by saying, yeah, we have uh, the necessities, which are, yeah, again, keeping the lights on, those sort of things. And then they have uh, what they might call family matters. And that's about, yeah, that's your youth group. And that's the uh, the church ski trip. And that's also... Uh, investing in other opportunities for um, expanding your auditoriums, things like that. And then you have missions. And within missions, they might further break it down into local and foreign missions. Um, Or they might have even more uh, delimiters like the city, the country, and foreign countries. You weren't necessarily prioritizing those as we I mean, because, yes, you need to make sure that you're keeping the lights on and things like that. But to what extent, because I think that there's a lot of third world churches that they would prioritize the ministry to people uh, even before uh, they're worried about having a roof over their head. To an extent, I mean, that is a different culture that, than we and most of our listeners, are, or all of our listeners, as far as I know, are accustomed to. Uh, and, and so I, the point of this podcast, at least in my mind, is to figure out how are we prioritizing the dollars that are coming into the collection plate? What is the priority for dollar number one versus dollar number 100? Um, and is the first priority make sure the building is operational or is the first priority uh, ministering and evangelizing? I'm going to... Um give a a brief anecdote uh, that's kind of in response to that. I apologize if it's indirect. Um, When I was studying abroad, I had the opportunity to go to St. Peter's Basilica. And um, if you've seen uh, any beautiful church, you haven't seen anything remotely close to St. Peter's Basilica. It is, without comparison, it's so far away from the next most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. It is breathtaking, um, and it's just a building. It's Where is that located? In Rome, in Vatican City. Yeah, um, that's the, that's the main church they have there. You have statues of all the apostles, um, and uh, it's and the, these huge vaulted ceilings and these elaborate columns and gold and marble everywhere. Um, it's it's amazing, and I remember. Walking in, the first thing that I thought is, uh, wow, look what the church has done. Um, granted, that was at the time of uh, some of the most corruption in the church. Um, that's probably what Martin Luther was responding to. Um, but that withstanding, it was still, wow, look what the church has done. We have made one of the most beautiful things ever created by man. And yet, Lauren was standing next to me, and the first thing out of her mouth was, wow, think of all the mouths this could have fed. Um, And then that just made me feel awful for a second. But that is a a question that I come back to regularly. um, And I think there is some relevance here uh, for what we're talking about. Is, does there have to be a priority? Is there always a number one priority for the money of the church? If you say it that way, then um, you basically have two contenders. Do you feed mouths to keep them alive, or do you spread the gospel to them before they die? Um, but it's one of those two things, and then everything else it's has fun. to be after that. It's saving their souls, saving their human bodies. So it's bread and water, or it's the gospel um, in every language. But does it have to? How are you? Is, really does it have to be like to that, them? or is there more nuance and context to it? Like Michael was hinting at. It's hard to say. Is there ever a time when you can build a beautiful basilica? Because there's always hungry, more hungry mouths to go feed. So let me speak on behalf of beautiful buildings. 
I, I think that uh, that is a gift uh, from other generations. And, and uh, you know, we can acknowledge that we do not agree with the group of Christians on doctrinal matters that built uh, St. Peter's Basilica. Uh, that said, uh, God is the, the creator of all beautiful things. And I think that he created man to desire beauty, to, to uh, he endowed us with the creative spirit to create art. Um, and I think, you know, if, if you're going to build a building, why not build a beautiful one? Why not uh, show the outside world that we think that uh, God is, uh, is worthy of our highest artistic efforts? Um, I, I think that there's, uh, and for the record, I, I think that um, there's there's a split within my own mind. Uh, I'm sometimes I'm a more uh, logical, mathematical person, but I, I hope that I always have space for the beauty, um, for that for the creative side of my mind to express its appreciation for God. And I, I think that the church budget can reflect that, that the church budget does not have to be about maintenance and um, you know, taking care of the X, Y, and Z that we that we have, you know, put into our budget, the, the fixed parts of that, but it has room for creativity and room for uh, not every not having to justify every penny. So yes, our first priority as a church is to function in ways that will bring more people to Christ, and I think a creative way of doing that is showing uh, the outsider that Christians. Christians aren't against art. We we are the Christians are the first ones to promote art. So I know that's that's a tangent, but Daniel, I think your tangent is relevant to uh, to our topic. And on our podcast, we like to make scriptural references wherever applicable. Uh, we can look at Solomon. Solomon wanted to build God uh, a temple for him to house in. What was God's response to that, though? Um, I mean. He cannot be he cannot be contained by something built by man, essentially. And before that, he, um, his dwelling place was in a tent. Um, and so, uh, obviously, that's not what the church is doing. We are making uh, a dwelling place for the church to gather. Uh, essentially, you justify it by saying this will bring more people in because um, it's more comfortable. Things like uh, that the amenities are going to uh, make it more convenient for people. At that point, you know, you're kind of missing the, uh, the big picture. Um, other scriptural references that we know, wh what is the church supposed to be doing? Taking care of the poor, the uh, children, the widows, the elderly. Um, those are the things that we see specific examples of the church doing with their time and community and church funds, um, we also see the example of uh, Paul requesting funds to support um, his preaching and missions. Um, so, so I what other examples do we have? I think the best way to take care of orphans and widows is to provide a soft cushion for them to sit on during the worship service. But anyway, that's... <laughs> and... Yeah, most of what we Heaven see. Heaven forbid that you accidentally sit at in their seat and they come. <laughs> That's my seat. You need to move. So it's is that an issue? That's an issue you take up with the uh, budget committee. Um, they they have to deal with <laughs> licensed <all>. seats. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> it'd be like uh, senior year at, in high school. We got to go and decorate our seats or paint the parking lot say, this is my spot. So I think they should start doing that for pews now. Pay a small fee. This is now your seat. We're, we're often gra graffiti the church pews. <laughs> exactly. We're off on such a tangent here, but why do congregations set aside the close parking spots for the visitors? Why not for the orphans and widows? <laughs> Michael, that's just ridiculous. Sorry, guys. Sorry. My bad. Okay. All right. Well, so let me... Uh, I was going to say that there's two quick things I'd like to hit on uh, while we're uh, talking about this. Uh, one of them uh, we've kind of hinted at is um, the the church budget that goes back to the congregation itself, its internal ministries. 
we talked about uh, things like the youth group and uh, things like that, and I think you mentioned, Daniel, a church ski trip. Yeah. Uh, at what point do, does it become more of the church catering to itself, or I think what we talked about beforehand, it becomes uh, something that you can describe as leisure, where you're basically just putting money into the collection plate and then taking it right back and uh, enjoying uh, the benefits of your own contribution. Yeah, I think there there definitely has to be a limit on that, and y'all y'all are, have already talked about your background in finance. Maybe you can you can ballpark some sort of rule of thumb for that, but there clearly has to be some sort of limit, or else. Uh, the church just becomes, uh, it, it equates to a social club or a, uh, a country club. Country club. Some, yeah. Um, and that's, that's clearly not, that should be something, I, I don't think the church should be denied that. Um, we come together as a family. We can have these fun uh, activities together where we can grow closer as a family. But clearly, yeah, the the... Uh, the motivation should be, and most of that sort of spending is what is going to develop the um, spiritual lives of these uh, members and partners. What's going to make this youth group grow up into adults who will have Christian children and adults who are going to um, influence their community for the better? What is going to um, what is going to involve these classes or activities that's going to help the people who are already adults or your 39ers or 49ers class, uh, whatever you call it where you're at. Uh, what's going to be good for the, the small children that makes them better Christians, um, that betters their relationship with God? Right. And, and, you know, you can justify anything that you put your money towards and say it's it's helping somebody spiritually in one way or another. You could feed your entire congregation after every church service and say, well, we're creating fellowship. Uh, you can say that we're going to pay for the entire church to go to uh, on a mission trip to Hawaii and we're ministering to the Hawaiians by showing them how Christians should <laughs> act, but yet we don't actually talk to them this is how Christians act at the beach. All right, so, I mean, you can justify it any way that you want. I am going to take the most conservative approach to this and say that there's no room for the church to put any funds to anything that is outside of a, min, a specific ministry that we can see in Scripture. Um, the uh, Now, you say, well, wait a minute, there's no such thing as a youth group in Scripture. Does that mean we don't need to be paying our youth ministers? Uh, I think a youth minister should also be able to minister to the rest of the congregation just as any other minister at the church should. Great, they're they're better with kids, let's assign them to that. That's fine. Um, but if you're roundabout way saying, if you're basically taking your money and using it to just uh, for the purpose of enjoyment and just taking your collection money, and then just taking it right back. It defeats the purpose of it, and there are people out there that need to hear God's Word, and there are people that have heard God's Word that need it reinforced to them about how to uh, better maintain a godly lifestyle. One other thing, guys. Pay structure for your staff. When you are allocating your budget, how much should your preacher be getting paid? You got your small... Uh, you know, uh, country church out in, um, out of town that they don't have as big of a budget. And sometimes you have volunteer preachers uh, out there. Or, uh, sometimes it's the eldership that are doing the preaching, not necessarily collecting a paycheck. Then you got your, um, city center churches with mega, uh, or a mega church that have a very high paid preacher making millions of dollars. What's the proper balance? I will go ahead and give a, a brief answer and let Michael um, give a more informed answer after me. Um, uh, I would, I would think if you are already if you're working under a congregational method where you are paying your minister, so obviously there are going to be churches where they don't have paid ministers. People are volunteering to do that work. Um, in which case, whatever you do give them is icing on the cake. It's not necessary. Um, but it's just a, a free will offering. Um, 
but uh, for uh, churches where you are the primary source of income for that minister, uh, yeah, like, so there, there can be a huge spectrum here. Are you paying them minimum wage because they're, they're uh, starving for the gospel <laughs> uh, because you've inflicted that on them? Or are you just paying them <laughs> as much as possible? So when you're at a huge church, that's a lot, and those ministers can get paid um, seen amounts of money. Uh, it makes sense to me to do some sort of analysis of that community and looking at the median income of that community. Um, that not only is just makes sense financially to me, but also makes sense as far as your preacher is then a part, has more in common with the people around him. Michael, give, give us a much better answer than that, please. Now, well, I thought that was... Uh... Good question, good answer, uh, good thoughts so far. So, so let me start by saying this: um, I've been, I've never been a part of a congregation that put a part of their budget towards a ski trip. Uh, that said, I'm not saying it doesn't happen. Um, the congregation I'm a part of now actually gives uh, money to a nearby uh, congregation that uh, draws from a less wealthy demographic. And I'm sure a portion of the money that goes to that congregation goes to supplement the income of uh, the minister there so that, so that that minister can have a respectable income and do ministry for the poor uh, that attend to that congregation. Now, I, I wish that our two congregations could spend more time together uh, so that we could share resources more, but, th but that's just one one instance. I did want to give uh, one scripture and then one other thought about how I, I think sh uh, the pay structure should work. Um, this is a, a verse that I've referenced before. Um, it's 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. It says, Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. Now, uh, there, there's a lot to unpack there. First of all, what I've said before is that I think that elders should be very involved in preaching. I think that's the way it was from the beginning. We can we have tackled that in other podcasts, so I won't uh, talk too much about that. But when it says double honor, most uh, commentaries, most scholars will say that what it's referring to there is pay. It's actually rewarding financial rewards for those who devote their life to preaching and teaching. Uh, it is that is what Jesus came to do on this earth. He came he came to preach, and that is uh, something that the church cares very deeply about and should be continued to be rewarded. Which leads me to my second idea, and here's the economist in me coming out that whatever the market will bear is likely what is deserved by a specific preacher. Uh, I think that churches have the ability uh, to understand when a uh, when an evangelist is effective, when that evangelist is drawing peop people into a transformed relationship with Christ, and that should be rewarded. Uh, if the market says that you know that it's a higher amount than than we're usual uh, than than we would usually allow then let's let's pay those people to stay in the ministry and so that they can devote more of their time uh, to the to gospel work. Also, that would encourage more uh, young people to see uh, gospel work as a viable uh, career option. Uh, the The preacher at my congregation has has often said on more than one occasion from from the pulpit how discouraged he is when he hears parents, discourage their young children, uh, their, their young men, from going into the ministry because they say, you know, everyone complains about it. You'll get fired after a few years and your, your pay is lousy. All three of those things should change. Our, our congregations should respect our ministers. They should uh, take care of our ministers. Now, they should encourage them uh, in to preach the word in a godly manner, but also they should be paid a respectable wage. Uh, not so that they can be the, you know, the, the most wealthy person in the congregation, but so that they can live a respectable life uh, with other members of the congregation. Uh, they're not outsiders that need, need to be treated differently than the rest of us. 
Um, so anyway, that's that's a long-winded answer to the question. You, you made me think of something, uh, Michael. Uh, it, it's uh, very commonly known that uh, preachers that are coming out of school do not get paid uh, as much as preachers that have been around for a longer time. Uh, and it's usually our younger preachers with the with more energy uh, that are sent out into the mission field um, where they may not be equipped because they uh, may not have as big of a knowledge. They're not experienced in the mission field. This is all fresh for them. Uh, and recognizing that, do you think that it would be uh, – more beneficial for us to pay our ministers that are going out into the mission field more than we would our ministers at home uh, and or incentivizing them in a way where you say we're not going to necessarily pay you money up front while you're in the mission field but we are going to stockpile you as far as like a retirement account goes so you're not going to see it until you get home so Work, work hard while you're out there, and you'll reap the benefits uh, uh, later. Yeah, Something so, like that. Oh, it just came to mind. I think that you know any way that we can incentivize uh, uh, evangelists, our, our preachers, to to go where they're most needed. To me, it's a good idea. But, uh, I'm half joking here, but half not. I think in some ways the way that we endow our missionaries uh, to to desire those things is we give them uh, professorships when they come back uh, to the states after they've been very effective out in the mission field at, at our Christian colleges. Um, That's also a good incentive. Yeah, I, I think that there are all sorts of things that we could do. I, I will say I remember being inspired by um, – I'll, I'll, I'll just name drop here. I, I didn't actually know him that well, but uh, Gordon Hogan, who taught missions at Harding for a long time. And when he retired from Harding, he went back to the mission field because that's what uh, he knew God had prepared him to do. I think that sometimes we see our retirement years as a time to – to lay back and relax because of all the hard work that we've done. Whereas I think missionaries have the mindset that that's just more time to spend uh, showing more people uh, the gospel message. So um, we are running short on time. So why don't we go around for parting shots? Uh, is there something that stuck out to you? during this podcast, or maybe another question that you think our listeners should be thinking about, whether it's uh, budget presentation time at, their, at the end of the fiscal year at their congregation, or if it's just something for them to be thinking about from scripture. Uh, Stephen, what do you think? So I think the important thing as an individual is that you uh, ask yourself, am I giving as generously as I should? And I this is not my money. It's God's money. This is He gave it to me to begin with, and I am. I can't even uh, begin to give back to uh, God all the blessings that He's given to me. And so, have that uh, in your mind whenever you're giving generously, and then when you're creating the budget as a church, the same thing needs to be going through your mind. How? Who better? How can God's kingdom be furthered uh, with these funds? Because it's going to mean so much more to someone else rather than yourself. Uh, without reiterating everything Stephen said, I'd say, yeah, ditto to that. That would, um, all of that is really good. Uh, I would also add that, um, think creatively with how you use your budget. Um, all of the congregations that are growing fastest around the world, um, those, those large congregations, have come up with uh, creative new ways to use their budget and invested those in uh, creative uh, programs that will bring people in to their churches. Yeah. Let, let, me, let me take uh, two, two quick shots. Um, number one, y'all are both making me think about the fact that sometimes congregations ask the question, what can't we do? I think congregations need to be, as Daniel said, creative and, and think outside of the box. That's not thinking outside of scripture. It's just thinking outside of the normal paradigm of what congregations have might have gotten into a rut with spending their money on. 
uh, I think creative solutions can be biblical solutions. So don't say just because we've never done it before, we can't do it again. Other real quick thought, um, communicate with your elders. Likely elders are those that are making decisions, financial decisions at your congregation, maybe some deacons that are involved in finance, but let, encourage them. Don't have every time that you talk to them be a complaint about the budget. Uh, maybe even invite an elder uh, to teach a class, two or three classes even, about how the church is using its resources and use that as a brainstorming session where the elder can get excited about the congregation's willingness to be involved with not just their financial resources, but also their time and energy to encourage the church. So uh, with that, uh, hopefully we've given our, our listeners plenty to think about. Uh, budgets aren't something that congregations usually talk about, but it's a conversation worth having. Thanks for listening uh, to this week's podcast, and we'll be back soon with another edition.